How was I blessed to meet Dr. King? Morehouse opened that door, my college. Dr. King was a graduate of Morehouse a few years before my time as a student. When Dr. King earned his PhD at Boston University, that announcement was made and celebrated on the campus of Morehouse College. So we were in a setting that brought us together. I met him personally in 1955 at a Baptist convention. A few weeks following the lynching of Emmett Till, had a chance to converse with him informally at that meeting, not knowing that in three or four months he would become the leader of the Montgomery movement. It was under the leadership of Dr. King that I became a disciple of nonviolence. I was a part of SCLC, organized a chapter of SCLC in Cincinnati, was a member of the board of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and later continued that work. My wife, Ed Winner, we've been married 57 years now, Dr. King performed our wedding ceremony that you are somebody. Don't let anybody make you feel that you are nobody. You are somebody, you have dignity, you have worth. Don't be ashamed of yourself and don't be ashamed of your heritage. Don't be ashamed of your color. Don't be ashamed of your hair. I am black and beautiful and not ashamed to say it. When you asked me to speak about Martin Luther King, I began to think about the history of when I met him and things like that. I had just gotten back from the Second World War and I went up there and I met this young lady who was very charming and, and wonderful. And I found out it was Coretta Scott. So Coretta Scott and I began to see each other regularly and we dated each other for almost six months. And then we said, wait a minute, I'm going to be an architect and she wants to be an opera singer. This is not going to work. So we decided to separate and not get married. And the first time I really met him was when he came to Cleveland to do a speech. He was speaking all the time. I met him there and we became pretty good friends. He was not famous then, but he was moving up. Mm -hmm. And I could, I could discern that this was a young man on his way. He had a mission, he had an objective, and he was very articulate, extremely articulate. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with a pen and ink of self-assertive manhood his own emancipation proclamation. Hearing him preach for the first time, an unforgettable experience. That photograph of Dr. King returning home from prison in October 1960 at the height of the presidential campaign between Nixon and Kennedy. That's when that photograph was taken. We met him at a small airport the late Dr. Wyatt Walker had made the arrangements for him to be flown from Reedsville, Georgia, where the prison was, to Atlanta in a private plane, and we met him in a delegation to welcome him home. It was a dangerous moment, the only moment in Dr. King's entire lifetime when he was in jail and prison alone, without anyone from the movement. We believed then and now that it was a setup for assassination. God, the hand of God intervened. 
I think that the thing that, that was so impressive was the fact that he was able to go into meetings and within a few minutes captivate the entire audience who listened to every word he spoke because he was very articulate, a very good master of the English language, and he could communicate with people very successfully. What was Dr. King like in informal settings as a human being, even in private, interpersonal settings? He was always profound and eloquent, but he had a great sense of humor. He could make people laugh. He could laugh at himself. That was an experience at Birmingham when Dr. King was literally attacked by a white American Nazi on the platform, on the stage. He was about to introduce me as the speaker for the occasion and was physically attacked. But Dr. King would not allow anyone to harm the individual who attacked him. The individual, the white man, was taken backstage, surrounded by all of these brilliant, strong, uh, some veterans, and they prayed for him while he was in the circle. He was surprised, stunned, astounded that no one harmed him. Later on, Dr. King said, you know that brother ought to go in boxing. He has a powerful right fist. It was that kind of skill, wisdom, personality he had of being able to turn what could be bitterness into humor or betterment. I like to think that the movement was built on faith, hope, love, and humor. The other day I was aware of the fact that I'm 100 years old. And I said to myself, what's happened to all those years gone by? And Martin was here about 40, 50 years ago, I think it was. Things in America were not what they are today at that time. And people were still struggling, trying to find jobs, trying to find opportunities. Martin came along at a time when we said, we're not going to riot. He's going to talk. He's going to speak. He's going to get these groups. And people came to him. So I think that uh, his message was, was, was brilliant. Uh, it it, it d disturbed a lot of people. A lot of people did not like that, but that was what Martin Luther King did. And that was his mission. He was determined to do that. If you ask me how do we realize Dr. King's dream today, I would say, one, we've got to understand and study the dream. What does it mean? Read his books. Grapple with the concept. Organize, preach, teach, and practice what he taught and practiced. And I believe he would be still calling for a community of nonviolence. We are waiting for the day when another Martin Luther King will come. Because they will come. They will come. They will become another leader who, who will lead us not into war, not into fighting, but into realizing that getting together, working together can make America even greater than it is now. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continue to grow and develop. And I submit to you that if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery couldn't stop us, the opposition that we now face will surely fail. Yes. Oh, hey. Oh, hey.